Well, good evening. Welcome to Grace Presbyterian Church. Welcome back, many of you. Um, I just, uh, I got three announcements for you. Uh, One is a reminder about our connection cards. Um, There's no visitors. So uh, all I need to say is, very truly, if you have a prayer request or or anything you need to communicate uh, to the church office or to the elders, uh, go ahead and just write on the back of that and slip it in the offering box. Um, the second thing is just a reminder that we do have our prayer meeting every week on Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Uh, we start on the dot, and we try to end as close to 7.30 as humanly possible. I'm watching the clock every week. And um, finally, um, because we sound, want to sound like a broken record, um, we are in need of more volunteers at Grace. And so I want to continue to encourage you to be uh, in prayerful consideration how you can use your gifts, your talents, your time, and your energy um, to serve all the saints. Um, so our particular needs are going to be Sunday school teachers, singers, and musicians, but there are plenty of other ways uh, that you can be involved and that your service would be uh, greatly appreciated. Well, with those announcements given, let's now take a moment to quiet our hearts for worship. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Christian, you know your God deserves praise, and your Lord calls you to worship him indeed. Hear him from Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud crashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So hallelujah, let's praise the Lord by first going to him in prayer. Join with me. Lord, we do indeed praise you. We should praise you in every place. We should praise you in every way that we can imagine. Indeed, everything that has breath should praise you. And so as we've gathered again for worship this day, we pray that you would be honored and glorified as we recite and consider your truth. Stir our hearts with your goodness. Lift our minds with your glory. And so make us crave to praise you according to your excellent greatness. Bless this service of worship and use it to continue to conform your people to the image of Christ and to show Jesus to all who hear. In the name of our great Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, please grab a red Trinity hymnal and turn to page 874 for our affirmation of faith this evening. It's going to be questions 63 through 66 of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. It's Trinity Hymnal, page 874, and let's now rise as we prepare to confess our common faith together. We're continuing through what the Catechism confesses to be the duty that God requires of man. And that duty is full and thorough obedience to his moral law as it has been summarily comprehended in the Ten Commandments. Tonight, we consider what that obedience looks like as it's called for from the fifth commandment. So, hymnal, page 874, question 63. Which is the fifth commandment? The fifth commandment is, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. What is required in the fifth commandment? The fifth commandment requireth the preserving the honor and performing the duties 
belonging to everyone in their several places and relations as superiors, inferiors, or equals. In question 65, what is forbidden in the fifth commandment? The fifth commandment forbiddeth the neglecting of or doing anything against the honor and duty which belongeth to everyone in their several places and relations. And finally, question 66. What is the reason annexed to the fifth commandment? The reason annexed to the fifth commandment is a promise of long life and prosperity as far as it shall serve for God's glory and their own good, to all such as keep this commandment. Well, amen. And so let us now use the Trinity hymnal's Psalter readings in order to address one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. This week, we'll be looking at Psalm 63, which can be found on page 807 of your hymnal. Psalm 63 on page 807. Psalm 63 is another psalm of David. And as we would see if we had the superscription printed in the hymnal, he wrote it when he was in the wilderness of Judah. The context of this psalm leads us to the conclusion that this psalm was likely written during Absalom's rebellion not Saul's persecution. And so what we should see is how good God is and how much we should yearn for personal fellowship with him. So that's Psalm 63 on page 807 of the hymnal. I'll read the normal font. Please respond with the bold. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. My soul clings to you. They who seek my life will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths of the earth. But the king will rejoice in God. Amen. Please be seated now. Now that we have heard God's word and we've confessed God's truth, that should lead us to repentance for our sins. And so let's take a moment to silently confess our sins, considering the call from the Lord in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, where he says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. And so let us now silently confess our sins of sins which stain us, reasoning with the Lord who is able to cleanse us of that scarlet stain of sin. Lord, we confess our transgressions to you. 
We confess the filth of our sins before you. You are holy and pure. and We are not. By the blood of Christ, forgive us our sins. Cover us in his righteousness and renew us continually after his image. In his name we pray. Amen. And so, Christian, hear now the gospel assurance of pardon from Isaiah's great prophecy in chapter 53 of the suffering servant, saying surely to us in verse 12, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sins of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Your Lord Jesus was poured out to death bearing your sins. And so he surely makes intercession for your transgressions, forgiving your many sins in his own righteousness. Well, out of a sincere desire for us to have more in our evening service, we are now going to continue to have a time where we hear God's word from the New Testament read in order that our minds might be filled this evening with the glory of Christ as he's revealed in both testaments. And so to that end, I ask you to return with me to Galatians chapter 1, where we began last week. This important book contrasts our true faith against the Judaizing imposter. We saw in the first 10 verses of this book that getting the gospel right is crucial. Errors in life and in doctrine can be dangerous. But the Galatian heresy, replacing the true gospel with a false gospel, is soul-damning stuff. It's of the utmost importance. And so Paul moves forward in his letter, reminding the saints of his testimony. But what you must notice, Paul's point in telling his testimony is not for us to be amazed by his story. His point is for us to realize that the gospel he preaches is not man's gospel. It's God's gospel. And so now I ask you to rise with me in honor of the reading of God's word. It's Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 through 24, where Paul writes, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in my Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the tradition of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me, in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. And then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I'm writing you before God, I do not lie. And then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Well, you may now be seated. And let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer this evening. Father, we are in such awestruck wonder that just as with Paul, you have shown us grace. And that in Christ, you have saved us by that proclamation of the gospel. We marvel to consider what you have redeemed us from. All the futility and wickedness and sin. All of the zeal for the traditions of our fathers. Knowing your gracious goodness in our lives and in the lives of your saints assures us that you can indeed do anything. And it proves to us that you will indeed do good for your precious redeemed people. And so we pray to you now. Father, you know that many here now and many in our congregation who aren't gathered this evening have great needs. 
You know our personal, relational, and familial needs. You know how our bodies are weak, our minds are overwrought, our souls are weary, our relationships are in tatters. You know our every pain and anxiety, our every injury and fear, our every disease and deprivation. We pray that you would meet these needs wherever they are found among the saints at Grace. Father, you also know that each and every one of us is a sinner. We are sinners who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for salvation. But we still feel the pull of the world and of the flesh and of the devil. We are still drawn by temptation, deceived by iniquity, tripped up by sin. So we pray for you to give us an ever-increasing holiness. Show us the evil of sin and so give us a distaste for it. Empower us by your spirit to mortify the flesh and live unto you. Make, make us each more and more like Jesus and less and less like the world. Use all your appointed means to do this. And Father, we do pray for this nation. You've placed us here. And, and you have placed all of the rulers and the authorities in power. Teach us to trust your sovereign goodness at all times, in all of your ways. And remind us that you are supreme over all things, even over all the nations of the earth. And so we pray that you would give prudence and wisdom and even restraint to our many leaders. Lead them to do good and to restrain evil. Father, may all of our leaders fear you. And so by, enable us to live quiet and peaceful lives that are godly and dignified in every way. And finally, Father, we pray for the work of missions across the world. Nations will come and go, but the kingdom of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, will endure forever. We pray for the continued salvation of souls wherever you have sent your servants. We pray for such near and far. We pray for such among all peoples, and tribes, and tongues, and nations. And so we pray for such in our, even our own nation. Father, keep sending the gospel to places where Christ is yet to be preached, and also keep sending it faithfully to where it has been known for generations. By the mighty working of the Spirit, we pray for you to save our neighbors and our friends, save our family members, siblings, parents, and children, save our loved ones, and even save our enemies. Lord, pour out your grace and have Christ glorified in the salvation of sinners. And please, we plead, save the ones we love. Save those for whom many prayers have been uttered and for whom many tears have been shed. Father, we lift up our many requests and needs to you, confident that you hear us, sure that you are good. And so we pray all these things, spoken and silent alike, in the name of our mighty and merciful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we continue our way progressively through the book of Exodus, we have arrived at chapter 25. Moses has already received one set of teaching, and he has then gone down from the mountaintop to communicate it to the people. But Yahweh is not done speaking, and so he calls Moses back up the mountain. What you hear tonight is how Yahweh begins this new section. And so now that you have found Exodus chapter 25, I ask you to please rise in honor of the reading of God's holy, inspired, inerrant, and infallible word, following along with me. Exodus chapter 25, beginning in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the people of Israel, that they take for me a contribution. From every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution for me. And this is the contribution that you shall receive from them. Gold, silver, and bronze, blue and purple and scarlet yarns, and fine twin, twinned linen, goat's hair, tanned ram's skins, goat skins, acacia wood, oil for the lamps, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, onyx stones and stones for setting, for the ephod and for the breastpiece. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. 
exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and of all its furniture, you shall make it. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Well, please be seated. and Let's once more go to our God in prayer for the preaching of his word. Holy Lord, we pray that you would be especially active and particularly glorified in the preaching of this word. By your Holy Spirit, use these ancient words to work fresh in our lives. Convict us of sin and comfort us in Jesus, for he is at the beating heart of the whole canon. Holy Spirit, give me your anointing and power in order to rightly preach the word to the people of Christ, unto the glory of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. After leaving the Lord's presence to go down the mountain with God's message, to go down and have that covenant confirmed and ratified, Moses has now made his way back up to the pinnacle of the mountain, to fellowship with Yahweh. At the end of chapter 24, we see the Lord call Moses even nearer to himself than before. We see him give Moses a privilege that none other receives. And after a week of preparation, Moses is invited up into the very presence of Yahweh. Moses enters into that glory cloud, a cloud which to Israel far off at the foot of the mountain appeared to be a consuming, devouring fire. As we closed considering last week, Moses, at this point, is practically in heaven itself. For 40 days and for 40 nights, Moses will commune here atop the mountain. As we'll see later, he will fast this whole time, neither eating nor drinking. But instead, he is being sustained by Yahweh himself, in this bright, glorious, wonderful paradise. For this brief moment of history, Moses, that great mediator of the Old Covenant, gets to dwell in the midst of Yahweh's own presence. That's a great gift of glory to him. Moses was most truly a friend of God. And so our text this evening we begin with the very first thing that the Lord has to say to this covenant mediator. In some ways, this is an extremely straightforward text, but there are some precious jewels for us here that we should dwell upon. And so I want us to consider this text using three Gs, the giving, the gifts, and the goal. So first, the giving in verses 1 and 2. The first thing Yahweh is now recorded saying to Moses is this, Speak to the people of Israel that they take for me a contribution. From every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution for me. The Lord directs Moses to take up a contribution. Perhaps this is not surprising. There are many who think the church is just a big Ponzi scheme, all about making money. There are many cynics out there who would think that Moses claimed to meet with God in order to extort these poor slaves of all the cash they had so that he might be a self-made king. And such cynicism is, of course, not at all founded in the scriptural record or even in the historical record. But there's abundant cynicism, especially when we talk about taking up a contribution for God. For some, starting out the contribution right here is just a non-starter. But knowing what the whole text says, there's going to be others who are not cynics who might think it would be quite reasonable for Yahweh to levy a standard contribution for the work at hand. He does so elsewhere, and so why not here? Why not ask for 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 percent? And so in in the face of hearts content with both a heavy hand and, and hearts suspicious of any asking, One of the precious jewels that we see in this text is that Moses is to take up a contribution from every every man whose heart moves him. The Lord directs Moses to take up a voluntary offering. This is an offering only from the willing. All the giving that's to happen here is giving that is freely offered. 
We can say that the Lord is actually giving his people an opportunity to experience themselves the gift of self-sacrifice and generosity. This is a, a blessed opportunity for the people to give to the Lord in thankful worship, to return to him a portion of what he has provided for them because he has given Israel everything. Remember, they were once slaves not so long ago, but now they are free. The beauty of this invitation grows as we proceed into the text. But the Lord wants this to be giving from the heart, which means that what Paul says in 2 Corinthians is not an entirely new concept. When Paul is talking about Christian generosity, just before quoting from Psalm 112, Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, Each one must give, must give as he has decided in his heart not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. This certainly seems to fit with that attitude of Exodus 25. God loves a cheerful giver, not a begrudging one. It's not likely that this love of this disposition began in the New Covenant. No, it's instead likely a love that he himself has always had when it comes to the heart of his people. And so we see that love on display in this passage. Each should give as their heart moves them, as they've decided in the heart, not reluctantly, not under any kind of compulsion, because Yahweh loves cheerful givers in this contribution. The giving should be freely and from the heart. And as Paul indicates to us, though our financial giving now is not the exact same thing as what's going on here in Exodus 25, there is a general principle at play. There's a precious truth about God revealed. He loves when his people give from the heart. Think of that widow with her two copper coins who gave more to God than all of the rich and boisterous givers at the temple. She gave so much more because in her heart, she resolved to cheerfully give all that she had to the Lord. He loves that kind of giving. He wouldn't be impressed by the quantity of what's given. He wants what is done to be done from a man's heart. He's never been impressed by exterior performance. He doesn't care if you bring him a truckload. He's always been interested in the heart. So second, let's consider these gifts as we see them in verses 3 through 7. This is the contribution Moses shall receive from those stirred, willing, and cheerful hearts. Verse 3, gold, silver, and bronze. Three precious metals presented in descending order of value and rarity. The list begins, as we would consider, rather normally. Gold, silver, bronze. But beginning this way reminds us to ask the question, where did this nomad people, where did these newly freed slaves get their riches from in the first place? Well, in Exodus chapter 3, verses 21 and 22, as Yahweh is appearing to Moses in that burning bush, the Lord God makes this promise to Moses. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall not go empty. But each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. And you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters. So you shall plunder the Egyptians. Israel would plunder the Egyptians. There is great wealth for them to give because the Lord provided such favor for his people. The Egyptians were promised to lavish them with such things before they left. And indeed, as the exodus is about to happen, as the Passover is being prepared, and as that final terrible plague is about to be unleashed, we read this in Exodus 12, verses 35 and 36. The people of Israel had also done as Moses told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked. Thus, they plundered the Egyptians, promised and fulfilled. The Israelites left 
with full hands. And so the people of Israel at this point had silver and gold and bronze. They had cloth and clothing. They had much because they had plundered the Egyptians. The Egyptians had given them great wealth and they plundered it. There's indeed a further detail to keep in mind. Not only would Israel have had massive wealth from this plundering of the Egyptians, they may not be so completely isolated from the other nations. If you remember back in Exodus 17, the Amalekites raided and waged war against Israel. This is when Aaron and Hur propped up Moses' hands so that the fighting forces under Joshua would miraculously win the day. This is when the people of Israel swore an unending animosity between them and the people of Amalek. So yes, they may have gotten some war booty from this fight. But if the people of Amalek can be found in the wilderness, even if it's only a raiding party, then there must be others as well. Indeed, it would make a good deal of sense for the Amalekites to have raiding parties in the wilderness if there were trader caravans that made their way through Sinai from time to time. Scripture is silent on whether all of these goods, like all of the many tents that would have been needed for a million-man nation to live in the wilderness, were plundered from the Egyptians, or if perhaps some were bought from such traders using that valuable plunder, that great gold and silver jewelry. And so if you think any of the items on this list seem like they would have been unlikely to have been nabbed by Israel— as they left in the Exodus, then there is no reason to believe that it could not have been bought from an industrious Midianite trading caravan, a caravan much like the one that first took Joseph from Canaan to Egypt in the first place. No lavish item should seem too rare for this contribution then. Let's then return to these gifts that are requested. Precious metal, gold, silver, and bronze. Pretty standard things to ask for. Next comes fine fabrics. Again, in descending order of rarity and value. Blue and purple and scarlet yarn. Living in the modern world, we can roll our eyes at such things being lavish. But for the majority of human history, up until just a couple hundred years ago, vividly colored fabrics were rare and costly. Dyes were often made from teeny tiny insects crushed up and mixed or else from certain parts of sea creatures. Richly colored fabrics were extravagantly expensive because they took great time in order to create the dyes. Egypt would have had such things. We know this for sure. Uh, We find such things in the tombs of the pharaohs and the burial places of other mummies. These richly colored fabrics were there, but such things were incredibly costly. Even that linen listed is a well-made material. It isn't the cheap stuff that you would find. Well, then comes the leathers. You have tanned ram's skins. That's going to be good quality leather. And then we have what the ESV renders as goat skins. One of the difficulties of learning and translating an ancient language, a dead language, is that sometimes there are rare words that are difficult to decipher. This is frequent in Hebrew, especially with various animals and animal products. If a word is only used a few times, then there's little context to give you clues. You'll see this come up if you read the book of Isaiah and all of the different footnotes for whether it's a rock badger or an owl, right? You know, there can be other ancient translations that can aid us as we look at these words, but things like the Septuagint, which is a good ancient translation, is at least a thousand years separated from Moses when he wrote Exodus. And they're basically going to have the same problem on this issue that we do. And then there's other what we call cognate languages, other similar related languages. In this case, like Arabic and Aramaic and Samaritan. And I say all of this because 
your translation or your ESV footnote may give a very different translation of what this is. So the ESV says goat skins. Others might say dolphin skins or porpoise skins or dugong skins. Either goat skins or sea mammal. It's the Arabic that leads folks to think that that latter option is the one that's possible. Uh, Arabic would be dolphin leather. And the leather of an aquatic mammal is a possible thing. It existed. It still exists. And such creatures could have been caught and then it could have then been tanned in and around the Red Sea. It's a possible thing. Apparently, such things are sturdy and luxurious. But the big difficulty for me with this translation, relying on the Arabic, is that dolphins are unclean animals. All aquatic mammals are unclean. They swim in the sea, but they have no scales. They're unclean. And so thus, I think it would be strange for such things to be taken as a contribution, just as I think it would be strange for us to be allowed to give a lobster as sacrifice or to eat pork at an Old Testament feast. I think the ESV translation is actually a good one. And what it is is a shortcut way of telling you what's going on with that other good translation. The thing that may connect this Hebrew word to the Arabic dolphin leather is that it may be referring to fine, luxurious leather that's imported from Egypt. If this is a fine, luxurious leather, then it would make sense for the similar-sounding Arabic to come to refer to a different fine, luxurious leather. Uh, a, a rough uh, equivalent for us is how the word Kleenex refers to all tissues. And words can sort of have that shift in meaning. Well, if you've ever handled a goatskin Bible, you'll know that goatskin is this very soft, creamy, luxurious leather, but also that it is surprisingly sturdy. The ESV's translation of goatskin gets you to that essential meaning. It's fine, luxurious leather. It's good stuff. Well, then there is to be acacia wood which would have been somewhat common and plentiful in Sinai. But it's a good and necessary building material in that part of the world. And then there's a shift. We sense something different going on in this list as we reach this point. There should be oil for the lamps, spices for anointing oil, and fragrant incense. This has gone from a list of fine goods that Yahweh would like to receive to fine things that are necessary for proper worship in the ancient world. And then even more so, priestly garments are mentioned in verse 7, especially onyx and other precious stones for the setting, for the ephod, and for the priestly breastplate. And by the end of this list, what we realize in these gifts given is that we've gone from God asking for a contribution of fine goods to God clearly calling for contribution to facilitate proper worship. That's the sort of stuff he's seeking from those whose heart he moves. He wants his people to worship him rightly. And so then third, in verses 8 and 9, the goal. Verse 8, Yahweh says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. It is now explicitly clear that all these things are being contributed in order to build God a sanctuary. The hearts of the givers and their gifts given are aimed at the construction of the tabernacle, that grand movable tent that served as Yahweh's dwelling place in the desert. And here in verse 8, we see the big deal of that dwelling place. Yahweh wants to dwell in the midst of his people. This truth becomes all the more evident at the beginning of the book of Numbers, where the camp of Israel is described for us. 
The tabernacle is to be set smack in the middle of Israel's camp. And the tribe of Levi is to encamp themselves around the tabernacle as a buffer for God's holiness. And then we find in that camp that three tribes are to encamp on the east and three on the south and three to the west of the tabernacle and then the final three to the north. God literally wants his tent pitched in the midst of his people. He wants to be in the middle of them. He wants to be the heart of their life. The tent of the sanctuary was intended for the Lord to draw near to his people because he is their God and they are his people. And now verse 9 shows us that the people are not building God any sanctuary that they please. They aren't going to dictate the terms of his presence. He is. This sanctuary that they are to build is to be built exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all its furniture. So you shall make it. There is a master pattern for the tabernacle and its furnishings to follow. There is a heavenly ideal. And whether the tabernacle and its furnishings are a scale replica or whether some features are analogous pictures of the heavenly, it still yet follows God's explicit pre-existent pattern which points to that pressing truth of Hebrews, that there is always something greater and more enduring than this old order. Moses built a tabernacle after a pattern. There was always the original in heaven, and it was better. Therefore, there is going to be meaning and all of the features and furniture that we're going to see over the next few chapters, meaning that persists even for us in Christ now. We're going to look at some of the features given in the following of this pattern to see what heavenly image is being conveyed to God's Old Testament people. That's going to be coming over the next few weeks. But the chief point today is that while Moses was invited to temporarily draw near and dwell with God. God himself was preparing to draw near and dwell with his people. That's one of the greatest wonders of the Old Testament when we see it. When that visible, wonderful, terrible, glory presence of the Lord was visible in his temple and in his tabernacle. It's a wondrous thing when he was in their midst. You know, that wonder is why when we get much later in the Old Testament, the old men wept when the temple was rebuilt after the exile. It may have looked nice, but Ichabod, it had no glory. It had no presence. And so those old men who remembered the old temple, they wept. The hope of scripture can be found in that theme of God dwelling with his people and his people then dwelling with God. And the new creation is, uh, the new covenant is one that is better than the old. God drawing near and dwelling is better and fuller now than it even was in Exodus 25. John chapter 1 verse 14 is a well-known but worthy proof of this. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Literally, in the Greek, the word became flesh and pitched his tent among us. He tabernacled among us, if we looked at the way that that word is used in the Greek Old Testament. The word of God, who was in the beginning and who was with God and who is God, came and dwelt in our midst, tabernacling among us. And as John 1.14 continues, And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. In the incarnation of the Son of God, Jesus Christ became a better dwelling place of God, coming in the midst of his people. He is the truer tabernacle. Isn't it so invigorating to think that in him, even we 
have seen his glory. In him is glory and the presence of God forever with his people. He is with us forever, even unto the end of the age. And he retains that humanity that he took on forever. God dwelling with his people and the promise of his people dwelling with God. And so then even better, far exceeding Moses' mountaintop blessing, he will ultimately draw us all nearer to God to dwell with him forever, even as he dwells with us in the new heavens and new earth. In him, all the glorious hopes and aspirations, all the wonderful pictures and types of the Old Testament come to fullness and fruition. Instead of weeping, we can look on him and rejoice. God has dwelt among us. He's dwelt in our midst in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is your God and you are his people. Amen. Let's now close in prayer. Lord, we are amazed that you would seek to dwell amidst your people. We are amazed that you would do so in the days of old, even among a stiff-necked people like Israel. We are all the more amazed that you would dwell among us in the incarnation of Christ, the Son enduring the humiliation of an ordinary man, and worse, enduring the humiliation of the vilest sinner. Lord, build us up in this certain truth that since Jesus suffered in dwelling in our midst, we will surely be blessed to dwell with you forever. Build us up in this great scriptural hope, in this truth that you are our God and we are your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's now respond to the preaching of the word and prepare to receive our God's blessing by reciting together that great psalm, the final psalm of ascent, Psalm 134. Please rise and use your bulletin to recite this psalm together. Oh, bless our God with one accord, ye faithful servants of the Lord, who in this house do stand by night and praise him there with all your might. Lift up your hands and prayer draw nigh, Unto his sanctuary high. Bless ye the Lord, kneel at his feet, and worship him with reverence meet. Jehovah bless then from above, from Zion in his boundless love. Our God, who heaven and earth did frame, blessed be his great and holy name. Amen. So lift your heads and receive your God's blessing the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.